Right. Okay. Let, welcome, everyone. I welcome you to Radio Wolf, our webcast for consciousness and culture. I am happy to have with me Tom and Mark. Tom, welcome to Radio Wolf. Thank you for having me, Thomas. It's a pleasure. Tom, we know each other for ages. Uh, we do similar work, as we just said. Uh, you are having a book publishing house, a German book publishing house, and you run a webcast, Parallax, and the Nomen Verlag is a German book publishing house. We do similar things in what you might call integral, metamodern uh, circles. We are interested in consciousness culture, and um, we are doing what we are doing uh, par uh, partly with similar perspectives, some uh, partly with different perspectives. And I thought to invite you on Radio Wolf for two things. First, what we do uh, comes from a perspective that is in the English speaking world and not so uh, often heard voice. I mean, a European voice. And I think uh, European non Anglo Saxon voices are, are need to be heard. And I think both of us uh, try to offer this also to the English speaking world. And also, we come from a certain dialectics between our works, which you call the dialectics between individuation and we space. So I would like to investigate both of those and see how our work interrelates. And I would like to start. Um, of course, what we in Evolve are doing is very much vSpace based. We even call it trans individuation. Your work, also your work as an author, and I didn't mention that you also wrote a couple of books yourself, is very much, much based on individuation and about agency and the necessity of responsibility, agency, and even a heroic position in life. How do you see this uh, relationship between our perspective, your perspective, how do they relate to each other? How do they compete with each other? What's your take on this? Oh, well, that's, that's a super complex and complicated question. But, um, you know, first of all, we are highly sociable beings. And so to think about psyche and consciousness and our being in the world, we, we have to you know, talk about, you know, how we are embedded in, in social networks and meaning making and, and you could make the case that, you know, without, without a social dialogue, there would be no thinking or no, no internal dialogue because it's kind of a reproduction internally. But at the other side, you, you have certain stages of cognitive development, which, you know, signify growing not only growing complexity but also like a deepening into you know who who we as individuals let's say truly are you know there's this this big myth permeating our philosophy since the beginning which is you know the idea of a diamond you know not the demon but you know more the socratic idea that there is something very profound within us that you know helps us navigate through the chaos of the world, let's say. And so that, you know, an increase in our cognitive complexities should always be accompanied by, by a deepening of the understanding of who we are and how we can express our deepest nature. And so you, you have a dialectic there. And then of course, it would be nice to uh, be embedded socially uh, in a way that those uh, these this quest let's say uh you know can can be ha harnessed and 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 brought forth in a social setting and so um you know i think i think you know the myth that we have to go into a cave to find you know this diamond this true self or to grow in complexity it's it's you know it's certainly one way. It's maybe an archaic way, and and I think you have a lot to say about you know enabling that kind of complexity through a social setting. And so it's like it's of course all interconnected with each other. It's like because the way I would describe it, I think that uh, our history, 
our human history for the last at least 5,000 years is a history of individuation. And it is a, a history where we came out of collective contexts, tribal contexts, traditional religious contexts, and we developed the capacity for agency in individual consciousness and responsibility. And it's a very powerful development of consciousness that is part of also the dignity of what the Western world has to give to the world. I think it's very powerful. And in, in that development, we also reached a moment of what I would call hyper-individuation, which is very much what you uh, can see in, in the postmodern culture, where the combination of individuation and uh, relativism uh, creates something where we lose contexts and all what we see are me spaces. Right. And at the same time, there is a need of a new integration. And this new integration uh, comes also what I would see uh, is developing in a movement of we spaces and, and forms of new dialogues around the world, which I see also kind of a, a second wave of uh, mindfulness, because there was this wave of mindfulness that happened the last 50, 60 years that really became center stage also in European American culture. But this mindfulness in itself was very individual based. And there's a new mindfulness movement that is dialogue, community, collective, v-space oriented. And I really think uh, that there's something where we have to learn to integrate our individuation process but also become more aware that even our individuation is a collective process. Even the fact that we became individuated, we didn't do it on our own. Nobody became individuated on their own. We did it as right. a culture. It always right. has both sides. And I see the necessity to move beyond this isolated individuation phenomenon that we also have as a shadow of an, uh, part of individuation to new forms of what we call trans individuation, transcends right. and includes individuation. And this is what I see is also the cutting edge, uh, uh, particular for European and American cultures. Right, so, okay, so there are a couple of things to unpack. You know, I, I completely agree uh, that, you know, the, uh, the story of individuation, I think that's that the basic narrative of the West. You know, it's a basic story. You know, it's like the searchers in America, you know, the way individuation and, and the strong and responsible and the striving individual, you know, the, I mean, like our, you know, uh, the idea of chivalry, you know, it's like, okay, we, we are, we are agents and together we build a community. So that's where I, I think it's like one of the basic myths, let's say, you know, that, that, uh, you know, the story of individuation, but then you said something that, you know, you said me spaces in regard of postmodernity. And I don't think that's an accurate description of what happens mm -hmm. in postmodernity, because if you look at postmodern uh, phenomena in our culture, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's group think, you know, it's, it's uh, tribal thinking, it's, you know, it's uh, feminists here, transgender people there, Black Lives Matter here, racist there. Everywhere, it's just groups and group think and community think. If you look at um, how, how society dealt in our postmodern times with coronavirus, it's about solidarity. It's not about me. It's about you have a moral obligation for your citizens uh, to have a vaccination. I, I'm not saying uh, I'm for or against it. I'm just saying that the, I, I observe it as a broader context that it's, it's quite the opposite, that we are not individuated enough in this time, right? And so it's like we are, we are engulfed in, the, in a kind of community thinking, you know, it's, uh, uh, which is like if you look at the, the model of Suzanne Kukreuter, and she, she explicitly says that, that the, that the postmodern stage is more communal oriented, and that the stage after that, it's more, it's more agency oriented, which doesn't mean that it doesn't integrate the other side. But it's like, if I look at postmodern cultural phenomena, it seems quite the opposite. It seems to me 
that it's all about the right kind of way to use speech not to hurt anybody you know how you know in group thinking all of the, those phenomena like my my argument is no you you have to you have to take responsibility for yourself think for yourself be more individuated i i'm i'm phrasing just this that the way just to annoy just to annoy you <laughs> you know <laughs> no, it's cool uh, let's unpack that because I think you're partially right, but only partially because I don't think it's the opposite. I think it's the combination of. If you look at the post phenomenon, uh, postmodern phenomenon, it is uh, on one hand uh, definitely a community oriented thing, but it's based on a hyper individuated understanding of reality where basically nobody tells me uh, about anything. So there is this right. hyper individu individuation, but there is also, uh, I completely agree with you, this communal thing and also identity politics. And I would agree with you that uh, we are lacking both. We are lacking on a mature maturation and we are lacking on a mature understanding of what uh, we spaces really could be. Right. So what, my understanding of postmodernity, one understanding of postmodernity uh, that I find interesting is that it's not a stage on itself. It's the stage of modernity in the face of self-critique, where more or less uh, the, the traditional modern understanding of individuation, of rationality, and all that what makes modernity is in a state of self-critique, where the model of the modern individual, the modern rationality, the modern also absoluteness of rationality is critiqued, but it's not this thing in itself. It's basically destructive. It's kind of trying to find itself self thing. So it, in that self, it, it's interesting, but it's not, it can't not meet you in itself because it, it's only a stage of, of critique right. of, mo of modernity. I love that. I love that. Can I just jump in there? Sure. Because yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I really love that because you know, it's like we're talking, so, sometimes we're talking about things as if they were true, like concepts like postmodernity are highly contentious, even like, like metamodernism, integral, turquoise, whatever, it's highly contentious, like from a philosophical point of view. And so, but okay, so let's look at Nietzsche, right? And so he says there are 200 years of nihilism, but he was the one who instigated and started nihilism with, you know, the negation of Christianity. And so, okay, so, Modernity in his sense is already a form of nihilism, if you look at it that way, because it uh, nihilates, uh, you know, all, all of the traditional Christian kind of worldview. And then if you look at postmodernity, critiquing modernity, you, are, you haven't left the state of critique. You haven't left the state of nihilism in the kind of way. And so there's an argument to be made that postmodernism is an extension of modernism in a kind of way. You could make the argument, it's like, I'm, I'm not saying it is like this, but you could make the argument, right? And so, and then, then I find interesting what Zach Stein says, that we're living in a time between worlds, like after this kind of frame, or world frame, and another one, which is like more hopeful or more positive and more affirmative in a kind of way. And so like we're in between and trying to figure out, okay, where, where are we right now? Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to, as a, as a footnote, because I find that super interesting what you said. No, I, and, and, and I completely agree with, uh, with, with your addition. And I really think it makes sense to think about our postmodern stage as this kind of uh, stage of self-critique where we try to find ourselves, where all what we developed, uh, particularly again, talking about individuation, but also about rationality, tries to, uh, to find different ways out. Right. And uh, part of it tries new communal things, but also with the relativism, it tries to kind of go further with our individuation process in the kind of nobody tells me anything. Everybody's right. There is no truth. Everybody has their own truth. It's this radical rel relativistic individualism right. that is part of postmodernity is part of the malaise. So how can we find together in maturity. And I think uh, we only can do that uh, by respecting 
and furthering the process of individuation, which means the process of agency and individual responsibility, just right. the, the capacity of individual choice. That's basically what I see what individuation is about. The capacity that I'm not just part of uh, a social uh, circumstances, I have the capacity of choice. To right. really honor that is the core of individuation. Right. Because everything are, uh, it depends on, and we can discuss it. There are many people who say this is uh, basically uh, a myth itself. Uh, but I would defend the capacity of individual choice. And mature, modern postmodern societies have to build themselves on the capacity of individual choice. Right. But then uh, the, the kind of uh, individuation in that sense that I find myself as an I sense is also a sense of separation because I defines the non I. Right. And the interesting thing is that even the process of individuation we do together. It's not something that uh, one single one of us have in, has invented, not even Nietzsche has invented it. It's, right. it's, part, it's a dialectics between individual and society, individual and, uh, and we spaces. Right. And to see that everything, even individuation, even separation happens also, not only as a collective process. Right. And to honor that and find a way where we fully mature, which means fully individuated, can also accept the fact of non-separation. And with non-separation, I not so much mean the mystical non-separation of the all oneness, but basically like the conversation that we're having right now is held by our individuation, right. our individual background, experience, capacity of choice, agency, and the space that we hold together that can be synergetic. Right. If we appreciate the space as a whole. And that is something that uh, Western culture is missing because Western culture, with the perspective or the overemphasis on perspective on separation, individuation, and agency, also in uh, difference to certain forms of Eastern cultures like Taoist culture, Confucian culture also South uh, Asian, Asian cultures, this overemphasis on agency and individuation, in itself, it's not bad, but it's one-sided. Right. There's something uh, that we have to learn to reintegrate the wholeness of life that always happens in a conscious, individuated we space. Still a very com complex issue because there are so many things uh, I can I could address. I think principally, you know, I, I, I think we're meeting at the same point here. And I, I think you would agree that, you know, a delusion concept of the individual, right, would something that is very much, you know, a, a fitting description of the actual reality, because like, I'm, I'm all my girlfriend's past, right, all, all I know through life. And it's like, because of those intimate, uh, you know, interactions and the way, the way how we now talk to each other and how, how I'm representing eternal dialogues all the time. So it's like, the, it's, it's, an, it's an idea, you know, to be an individual, right? And so it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't work. I also like the idea of, uh, of, of our friend Hansi Freinach when he says like death to turquoise, because, you know, in order to be full-fledged individuals that can hold the space, the, the we space, the transpersonal we space and have the maturation, you, you have to go through some serious growing, let's say, you know, and so, and so the question is really, you know, how you would achieve that. And, 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 and I think, like, I think our goal is the same, but our methods would be different because I, I, you know, I, I, I would always argue that, you know, um, I, I would always argue for a kind of critical and systemic thinking, right? And so, you know, I have a, we have a mutual friend, Dennis Wittrock, and I had this, this long conversations with him about, you know, it's like, okay, what does it mean to, to put your own worldview into, into some kind of brackets, you know, so you can view yourself 
and, and your worldview and your opinions and everything into a bracket and look at you in an objective way as if you're not thinking about yourself, but embedded in a, in a systemic context. And, but this is really much about a complexity, it's a, it's a complexity issue, if you can think like that. And, but this is like, an, it's, it's a cognitive process, you kind of have to learn and un, uncover for yourself. And so like, I always gravitate, gravitate towards, you know, unlocking this kind of complexity and ethics, so to speak. Um, to, un to achieve this kind of uh, turquoise being where, you know, the individual is fully fledged, if mm. that makes any sense, that volcanic eruption of different it, contexts. Mm. It, it makes sense. It, opened up, it opens up a different uh, a question and different dialectics. Uh, that's not so much the dialectic between individuation and vSpace, but uh, the dialectics between intuition and cognition. Right. Because there's something, and that is also part of our particular Western development, not only, that we can hold uh, a complex uh, integrated thinking in an abstract cognitive way, but that in, in itself uh, deprives us of presence. There's something that we cannot hold in a cognitive abstract way. And there's, again, uh, it's, it's powerful to be able to have con uh, abstract concepts like system thinking. Because uh, one example that I always bring is the whole Gaia spirituality that we have as a postmodern spirituality. You only can have with the, with the complex thinking because nobody, nobody has ever seen Gaia. It's a, it's a, we have seen our surroundings where we live around, uh, that's where nature spirituality can come in. But the Gaia spirituality uh, comes from the complex thinking that we can think that we're living on this globe and this globe has this ecosphere. That's all come, comes from abstract thinking. So the abstract thinking is powerful, but there's something where our modern, postmodern, complex uh, cognitive uh, way uh, is lost, uh, like Viveki would say, in prepositional knowledge. So that, that everything is just a cognitive preposition, but there are different kinds of knowledge, which for example, participatory knowledge that we are participating in this conversation right now is not only held in our minds. There are, there are layers uh, of, of knowledge that we have alienated us from. And I think that something like the mindfulness movement is also trying to, to push through this alienation to, to have everything just as being part of our uh, abstract thinking. And how can we integrate that is also okay, a very so, delicate okay. question. Okay, so but okay, so now you, you're using the word abstract. And abstract, you know, thinking has a, also a, a history in our in our philosophical background. And mm. I don't think I'm at least I'm not talking about abstract thinking when I'm talking about systemic thinking. You know, it's like when I when I talk about systemic thinking, I'm not talking about formal rational ways of you know uh, operating. I'm th I'm talking about let's say let's 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 use the word internal alignment, right? Because it's like okay, so you have to it it has it it, it has an intuitive aspect, you know, a participatory aspect, but it's still system thinking, but it's not abstract. It's it's it's, it's participatory in that sense that you uh, connect uh, with the systems that are there, right? That, that, may be, that may be a forest, that may be, you know, your own emotional state of being or your being in the world in a more broader sense, but it's still a, a higher awareness of your, you know, uh, mental setup, so to speak. You know, and so if I, may, if I may come in here, because uh, I would have a different perspective on this one. I would say system thinking is by nature abstract. The capacity of being able to think to, to, to think what the system is, is an abstract capacity. In, intuitions are never systems. They are, they are life worlds. And uh, they can relate to the same thing but from two different angles, 
So as soon as I relate to a system, I would say I'm in an abstract world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not the whole thing. I, I would disagree, because, mm -hmm. but only in terms of linguistics, because I think the, the term abstract is so connected to a modernist rational worldview. And I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the disconnectedness. You know, it's like it may be abstract in the sense that I, that it trans that what I'm talking about that it transcends the normal formal operational way of thinking. In that sense, it may be abstract, but it's still misleading. I'm not talking about this. I'm I'm talking about you know it's like if you look at stage theory, systematic thinking, which relates to the integral stage, has nothing to do with being abstract. I would say it has, and, and I, I would say that's part also of the, the fallacy of... Uh, right, okay, let's say metamodern. I, I wasn't... The... Yes, I know what you're saying, and you're right. Yeah. I'm yeah. not talking about this. I'm not... Because, as Jeremy Johnson, you could make the argument that the whole integral model is kind of modernistic. But I'm not talking about this. I'm not... I'm talking, you know, because of the stage thing and the, the boxes and whatnot. doesn't matter. The point is mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm talking about, you know, systems thinking... Where, um, where you have like the mental ability, it's not, uh, to, to, it's not to work with concepts. It's, it's more the, the capacity to put everything in order, you know, to, to see uh, what, where you are located and situated from, from, from the point of autopoiesis, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. from, from, from the way you, uh, your, social network is being a, a fractal representation of your internal cosmos and the other way around. And mm -hmm. so you can look at yourself as being part of a greater systemic uh, context, but it's not about models or something. It's more about a, a cognitive awareness, uh, how you are located and to, uh, to, to, to see that, right? And mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, and, and, and which I, I identify as as being, you know, post postmodern in the in the in the best sense. It's interesting because for, for me, uh, uh, this capacity is very much uh, uh, an intellectual one, a mental one, and in that by by nature also the, uh, an abstract one, and I don't want to. Uh, 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 kind of dismiss it because I think it's very important, but I really, uh, and maybe here I'm more postmodern than you are, uh, would emphasize the non mental capacities of consciousness to be able to hold uh, complexity in a different way. And uh, one way to abstract that is all uh, to, to, to bring it out is interesting enough, something that we, we are just bringing in the, in the newest issue of our magazine. It's the capacity of myth, the, because we also uh, uh, talk a lot, a lot about how uh, logos comes after mythos, and basically how uh, Western Enlightenment is basically uh, also a transcendence of the myth. But there's something where what we have lost by the capacity of myth, because the, the capacity of myth, which I think the capacity of language to hold symbols and to hold stories, that in itself holds complexity in a different way than our rationality, uh, needs to be honored in a transrational way, not in a pre-rational way. Right. Uh, and this is a, a different way how we can hold the whole in a human, which means in a language way, because there's also an embodied uh, intelligence that we share with all other mammals, but there's kind of a particular human way to that is related to our capacity of language. But there's something where systems thinking uh, is a rational capacity, the capacity to ha have true stories, true symbols that touch us existentially is a mythological capacity Right. That we also have to honor uh, because it holds something that our mental capacity does not hold. Right. Okay. So there, there are a couple of things super interesting what you say, because I, I think we, we, we have a misunderstanding because when I'm mm -hmm. talking about system thinking, I'm not talking about me being mental. Okay. I'm talking about 
you know, all these different layers from the body up, you know, motions, myths, mythopoetic, mm -hmm. uh, ecological, whatever, being the, the ability to align that within the autopoiesis of the psyche itself. But it's not mental, it's not, it's not only rational. And mm -hmm. so it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm, when I'm thinking about systemic thinking, I'm, I'm really thinking uh, about it in a way that it has transcend the, the duality of mind and body, let's say. So let's like, for, for example, so there's like this guy, Eric Gans, and he's like a famous anthropologist. I don't know if you know him. So, but he has like this idea of myths because you mentioned this so in his what, what is that and so in, in his kind of sense it's it's a, a it's a social scenery that re repeated itself so many times right that that it would part of our collective and archetypal setup so you can't really say if it's individual if a, if a, if a archetype is kind of individual or if it's social because it's both but you have to have systemic thinking to be able to relate not only to this deep core of yourself, but also that it represents a certain kind of social and worldly reality. And so that immediately uh, um, you know, embeds you in, in, a, in, a, in a reality that is not only mental and not only cogn cognitive. And so I'm talking about systemic in this kind of sense. Understand, and uh, I'm kind of tempted to go <laughs> deeper into this whole. Though it's a different dialectics than the dialectics we started with, but it's in fact it, it, it is very related. Because my claim would be that systemic thinking is always mental by its capacity, and uh, I don't mean this is a bad thing. Just as a, a, a kind of a precaution that this in itself is on a prepositional level to relate to complexity, and. It's needed also in relationship to myth because we have to reflect critical on myth from a rational point of view in order because they're wrong myth and uh, true myths and wrong myths and, and it needs a rational capacity to kind of distinguish between them. But to see there's something that we do, do not enter with our critical thinking, we enter with our intuition and with our capacity of a deep uh, uh, yeah, archetypes to open up and, and right. to understand them, to not not, on, not just to understand them, to to uh, to to, uh, to be with them. It's different uh, than than understanding with them and to live right. them and to Maybe see a... that, that there is something that we also can and have to learn from pre uh, uh, pre individuated indigenous cultures. Right. That that are much more kind of embedded in this kind of worlds in a in a, in a non-critical uh, way that we should not regress to, but still have a lot to learn from. Right. Uh, to find higher ways of integration, and this is something where just to to honor that we are together in this, uh, and that uh, in the the way uh, conversations unfold, also this this images, the symbols, the stories unfold, um, is something where I think that a, a metamodern uh, uh, integral capacity of experiencing, thinking, and relating to uh, to reality uh, is 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 opening up. Where I find that again, we need both. We need rationality and the capacity uh, of a new relationship to mythology. We need individuation and the capacity to trans-individuate uh, where something comes together in new forms of wholeness. Right. Um, I completely agree with everything you say. It's just, I, I suspect that mm -hmm. where we treat the word systemic differently, mm -hmm. I, I suspect. And, you know, let's, you know, we, we could make, you know, uh, we could we could play a game let's say you know you you could for example um what i mean you could put your whole worldview or your argument into kind of brackets and argue may argue argue my way and i could do the same and i could see the uh contingency of my own worldview mm -hmm. and could could uh, the and the kind of relativity of my chosen narratives mm -hmm. and then i could argue your way and so that would be a way 
um, where we exercise a kind of cognitive matureness while holding in a mature we space. But this is kind of what I mean with systemic because we are able to hold that, to participate, but also be very fluent with the games and with the narratives we are we're employing. Mm -hmm. And so and so that's what I that's what I mean with systemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. And I, I also I would like to leave it there because I think it's clear enough the different perspective on systemics right. and that there's there's validity to both sides and, and also how they interrelate. And right. uh, I, I what you just said I, I very much agree with. Right. Right. I mean and then I, I don't know um, if, if if you want to, to lead to the next question, but I think, uh, no, I give you the word because you're the host. No, I would like to come back to uh, this uh, interplay between uh, the emphasis on individuality right. and agency and the necessity to uh, also move beyond that in a new integrated way. And what I find the most powerful or the one way to describe the powerful capacity of that is what I would call synergetic intelligence. But for example, in, in, in this small we space that we are holding right now, with our backgrounds, with our, our experience, our faults, our, our shortcomings, our capacities, uh, and our capacity to create at least to some degree mutual understanding, at least I hope so. Uh, in that, uh, when we do this in a responsible and empathetic way, there's the, there is the, pot, the possibility of synergy between what we are holding. So we can also do this in a different way, in a, in a contentious way, where basically I tell you why you are wrong, your, uh, your kind of understanding of uh, systems theory, da da da. And, uh, but, but there is a different way where, where I seek for mutual understanding and where I look where there's synergy opening up right. between us. And that I find much more interesting. Right. Not, not that I, it's also important to disagree and it's important to, to, to also work things through and, 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 and see one, one's own blind spots and all that, that's important too. But in the end, what is really important is to find higher, for, higher forms of integration and synergy. And that we need all our capacities to, to accept that we are in something together that is beyond my worldview. It's beyond also my understanding of systems reality. It, it, it's something that we, it's a living something that we're together right now, just this we space of two, that in itself is a wholeness just because we relate. Right. The capacity of relationship creates forms of wholeness. Right. And in that, to look for What's the particular synergy that, is cap cap that this wholeness is capable of creates higher forms of collective intelligence. Right. Where all you are holding and all I are holding, am holding, is coming together in an interesting way that uh, uh, we both can learn from. That's the capacity where I see the V-space orientation is the, is, is the orientation to, to basically hold the differences that we have in a way that synergy can show up. Perfect, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's one half of the equation. But it's okay, the bring the other half. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's perfectly valid from my point of view, what you say. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm personally, I'm striving for when I'm doing podcasts. I, I mentioned this in our personal conversation. Mm -hmm. It enriches me and it makes my life happy. And if I meet people like you or like the, those people that I interview and or that I just have casual conversations with, it's just that's the, the you know, that's the thing that enlivens me, you know, and that brings me forward in the kind of way. The other the other aspect of it, I would say, that is of equal importance, at least to me, is, you know, the, you know, the individual, let's say, uh, ability to confront to confront chaos you know, to, to be able, you know, to broaden, you know, your own perceptions, you know, of who you are and what you want to do to find new ways of internal realignment, to hold 
true or find what is true to you and more than anything to translate that into action because you know my my contention with postmodernity uh, in in a, in a great sense is the inability to act and it's like talking 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 and yada 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 and we're talking about this model and this and this but you know it's like for me uh, the 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 old christian you know talking about myth uh, the old Christian saying you, you should recognize them by their fruits. It's very much important, you know, if, if we want to transcend postmodernity, because it's like, okay, so maybe you have a greater understanding of stages or systems theory or autopoiesis or ecology or whatever. So, but if you don't translate that into action, and that means you, then it's not worth anything, right? And so it's nice and it's better to do this with somebody else without any doubt, but you, this, this responsibility to go into action, to, to find a way to translate that and to, to confront that, you know, the uncertainty of if you can do it, do you find a way? Um, can you find the proper way that aligns your deep self with the issues of the world? That is such an individual question, mm -hmm. you know, to, so, and without that, you know, any, any social, intercourse let's say mm -hmm. is kind of futile because you don't have neither the depth nor the complexity to act meaningful in the world and again if, if two of those people find each other or even 10 or 50 or Dunbar number 150 love it best thing ever but you know without that and I think that's the reason why Hansi Freinert says death to turquoise because you can't spiritually bypass that kind of uh, maturation where you said, okay, I, I know who I am, I know what I want, and I'm dying mm. for this, um, if necessary, because that's the deepest truth of what I am. And I have the mental complexity to align that with the issues and challenges and crises of the world. And then mm. I'm looking for people who have that same thing, and then we're going at it. And so that would be my approach to it. I, I agree. And let me translate this to, uh, to my our language. I would make a distinction between pre-individuated V-spaces and trans-individuated V-spaces. And the, the difference is exactly what you're talking about. Because, because both, it's a little bit like pre-rational and trans-rational. There, there, there's something, both are V-spaces, but pre-individual V-spaces are completely different, uh, different than trans-individual V-spaces because they are built on the freedom of choice and responsibility. There's a different birth ground of this V-space because it is held by exactly what you're describing and it, it, it can't come to existence without our maturation. Uh, without our maturation, or any kind of V space we, we hold together is pre individuated. It's just some, right. some, some group think, some mythic, uh, in the traditional understanding of mythic, kind of being bound together by something that we don't really understand or, or, or don't take responsibility for. So there's something different where I really take responsibility for what I'm together in with you. Right. And see that this is something that uh, is completely also based on me, on my capacity to respond, on my agency, but it's also completely dependent on my capacity to surrender to what we are together in. Right. Because I cannot act really in isolation. Right. I only can act if I surrender to the fact that I'm integrated in something that I'm part of something, like part of this conversation. This, com this conversation that we're having only can come to its own uh, fruition right. uh, if we surrender to its wholeness. So that it needs my responsible agency capacity to understand all my mature being as far as I have it. But it needs also my surrender, uh, also my surrender to you as as the other of the conversation so that I really, I'm willing to meet you and not just compete you. So that, that there's this level that I really uh, just honor the fact that uh, you as a Tao are present to me and I am with you and you're with me in this kind of thing. That, so there's, there's something 
uh, very powerful in the human relationship to, to really ex accept and, uh, and honor the fact that, that I'm with you and not just with kind of a computer voice. And, uh, that, and, and allow that this transforms me, my presence transforms me. And then also that there are some, there's something that transcends both of us. Right. And this is uh, the other side of agency. This is surrender. Uh, this is empathy. This is love for something bigger. And it needs the, uh, the holding of both for a higher integration, right. or in my sense of it, trans individual to V space to really flower. Right. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, like we, we are, we are, we, we don't have, you know, we are not the masters of time. The time and the zeitgeist also has us, you yeah. know. And so, and so we are embedded in zeitgeist and cultural movements. And so, you have a job because you feel that the morphogenetic field, or whatever you want to call it, is enabling you to do what what you think is right and so what you're doing is you know you you bring these voices together you build community you talked about digital campfires you know in in, in the beginning of our conversation it's like okay so it's not it's not just you that wants to build community it's also that you know culture wants you to build culture in a kind of way and so and so and so and when I, I do the same thing with Parallax and Peter Limburg does the same thing with the Stoa. And so, and I think it's, it's you mentioned this, you know, in a previous conversation, it's not only artistry, it's also that curating, you know, the, the, the right conversations and also the right people in a kind of way, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I would presume you wouldn't be able to do this in a meaningful way with say Ken Jebsen or with Alex Jones, for that matter, right? And so, like, we're we are in, in, in this kind of, you know, vortex together, where, you know, society and culture wants us to do and needs our maturation, let's say, you know, because otherwise we couldn't do this in a way, but we are very much embedded in, in all of this. And, and apparently, I mean, it's like you had the conversation with, with John Vivecki and, and all these people in, in your 500 or whatever number uh, of podcasts you have, where you bring all these people together and have these kinds of conversations. And that also, it's, it's, it's not just a personal achievement, it's also signifies that culture and zeitgeist wants you to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you're all, and so you, you know what I mean? And so it's like, it's always this interplay. And I, I see myself in the same kind of job description or tradition, if, if you will. Tom, uh, uh, as we are in, at the end also of our time here, uh, I think we have to continue this conversation. Sure. <laughs> I, 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 I find it very interesting. And I, I mean, I hope it didn't get, get too abstract in, in, in what we tried to touch, but I think uh, all this interplay between individual we space between mm -hmm. rationality uh, intuition empathy uh, uh, myth uh, they are very relevant to how we can create culture and also to put it again the way you put it how culture creates us right and uh, I think that's the conversation to have so right. thank you for this and uh, I well thank I you Thomas for having me yes mm -hmm. Perfect.